Psalm 68 is a very long psalm, but we want to emphasize verse number one that says, God arises, his enemies scatter, and those who hate him flee from his presence. The King James Version says it this way, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Shake your neighbor by the hand and say, neighbor, neighbor let, God let God arise. Look at them again and say, neighbor, neighbor let God let arise. God. Amen. You may be seated. God has already promised the victory to his people. There's a song that we sing in a church that says, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. We already know how the story ends because in the end, we win. But even though we know how the story ends, it is sometimes very difficult for us to make it through the battle on our way to the victory. And victory is defined as the overcoming of an enemy or an antagonist. It is also defined as achievement or mastery or success in a struggle or endeavor against the odds or difficulties. Life has not promised us absolute freedom from pain and struggle. Jesus even told us that in this life we will have trials and tribulations. We are assigned the task of faith seeking understanding. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, we are on assignment. Amen. When we were in school, we had certain teachers that we liked and certain teachers that we did not like. And it was typically the teachers that we did not like were the ones that gave us the most homework. And that homework was often called a homework assignment. And if you were like me, and at the times that you wanted to get on that teacher that you didn't like his good side, you would make sure that you did your homework. But the next morning when you got to school, you had some raggedy friends like I did who did not do their homework, and they wanted to copy your paper so that they could make it look like they did theirs. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't copy my homework. Amen. As we have been on assignment by God, it is our responsibility to do the work that God has sent us to do so that we can make sure that we experience all the blessings that God has in store for us. We are assigned a task of faith-seeking understanding. All of us are at different levels of faith on our journey, but we are seeking to understand the message that God has given us in the moment or the struggle that we're in. And then we are assigned to seek the face of God in the midst of our circumstance so that we will know what to do the next time someone else around us wants to copy our homework. We are called to walk by faith, but also to get wisdom and understanding through the struggles of the human experiences. Whether you're willing to admit it or not, somebody else is going through the same thing you're going through right now. That's why God has given us the wisdom of Sister Paul Ramona so they can tell us how to go through. That's why they've given us the wisdom of our grandparents and our great-grandparents to pass on it down through the years that the Lord has been good to us. Many of the problems we face are often too difficult for us to understand on our own. This is why the hymn writer says that we are understanding better by and by. We are dependent upon God's help in order to achieve the true victory over our troubles because from our perspective the way things look right now it seems like the enemy has the upper hand even though the psalmist tells us that the, he will make our enemies our footstools, it seems like right now that the pressure of the size 13 boot the enemy has is pressing down deeply upon our necks. It is often suffocating to us to the point where we don't see that there will be a return. But God has already given us the victory and it is our assignment to let God arise in our situation so that our enemies may be scattered. Uh, clap your hands for God arising in your situation. So what is needed from the church is radical faith in God that gives us the victory over our troubles. If we already know how the story ends, if we know how the picture has been painted, and we know that the picture is worth a thousand words, what we need for God to do in us is to show up in us so that we will have radical faith. Everybody say radical faith. 
the book of James tells us that faith without works is dead. And so therefore, in order to be assured of victory, you must understand that a battle is necessary. Amen. You remember how in school on the playground when there was going to be a fight on the playground, all the kids would gather around and say, fight, 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 fight. And this is when the young boys, ladies, would try to be the real man. So they would try to do things that they weren't supposed to be doing that had nothing to do with the fight, especially when it was between two girls. Y'all know what I'm talking about. People are not paying attention to what God is saying because when we are in the midst of the battle, our minds are on everything that is going on around us instead of what God is trying to do in us. Instead of trying to instigate a fight, most of the time you should be trying to break up the fight. Instead of trying to stop the fight, most of us out there trying to start a fight. And when we are in a fight for God, many times it's a fight that we didn't even start. We are asking God to break up the fight around us instead of learning how to put a fight in us. And sometimes, whether you like it or not, you got to learn how to fight if you want to win this war. Therefore, in order to be assured of victory, you must understand that a battle is necessary. The problem with today's church is that claiming that God has given us the victory gives us the false notion that we do not have to fight for what God has in store for us. We want to, to do nothing while we want God to, to do everything. But if the battle is with our finances, we can claim and name that God has given us the victory but we still got to join the fight. If the battle is with our health, we can name and claim that God has given us the victory, but we still need to join the fight. If the battle is in our family, we can claim and name that God has given us the victory, but guess what? We still need to join the fight. This is why God tells us in Ephesians to put on the whole arm of God. The whole arm of God is not just a a suit for us to look cute in or just a dress for us to wear to the prom, God is sending you a message that there is going to be a battle and in order to win this battle you got to get ready for the fight. Just touch your neighbor and say get ready for the fight. Israel knew that in order to move from trouble to triumph, God would have to lead them through a military conquest in order to achieve a true victory. Whether you look back at Israel's story from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, there were always discussions or descriptions of great battles that were fought and won on behalf of God in the face of a formidable enemy. You remember David when he faced Goliath on the battlefield. David was a little ruddy teenage boy and Goliath was a giant of nine and a half feet tall. But he says that the Lord will deliver you into my hands. You remember when the Amalekites were fighting the Israelites out on the desert land and God gave the Israelites a victory by allowing Moses' rod to be stretched out and Aaron and Hur were propping up his hand on both sides and each time Moses' rod would wane to the bottom, Israel would lose in the battle. But every time they would lift up Moses' rod, the Israelites would win in the battle. And this is how you could say with a testimony that while you were in the battle, it looked like the enemy had the upper hand and when they came in like a flood, God raised up a standard against them. Psalm 68 is a victory psalm that celebrated how God blew the enemy away like smoke and melted them like wax. It pictures a, a very vivid picture of three military processions. The first was the victorious nation. The second was the victorious savior. And the third were the victorious seekers. And in order to achieve a true victory, we must desire a victory not just for ourselves, 
ourselves because the problem with America right now is that we want to pick on one man as a source of our problems but not willing to admit he symbolizes the ideology that we have made so American, that rugged individualism, that pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, that I did it all by myself. It is my me, myself, and I mentality that's got us in the situation that we had where we no longer practice what we preach and it takes a village to raise a child. Understanding that Jesus is our Savior, meaning that if we believe that God delivers us uh, from sin, that means that he also can deliver us from the power of sin that is suffocating many of our lives. And have also a song of praise for everything that God has given us. In other words, don't be complaining about what you don't have. God is looking for an attitude of gratitude to arise in your situation for you to start praising them for what you do. So here's the question today. How do we turn our troubles into triumph? Anybody out there besides me got trouble? I'm not ashamed to say on Sunday morning that sometimes trouble is in my way. I wish I could be like some of y'all. I wish I could find the crocodile tears, but God has not allowed me to have them yet. But I want to borrow some of yours that I feel like crying sometimes. But when I listen to the song that says, I lay awake at night, but that's all right because Jesus will fix it for me right now. So what we need to do in order to turn our troubles into triumph, first we need to see God's victory in every situation. Touch the neighbor and say, see the victory. See, look at what verse 1 says. It says, let God arise. They are not saying that God is existence, is dependent upon their praise or their proclamation. Now, what they're simply saying is that they're giving notice to the enemy that God is on their side. See, I got good news for you. Your enemies would not mess with you if they knew the God that you serve. This is how you know you're dealing with ungodly people. The people that right now is talking about you and scandalizing your name, they ain't read a word God said. Because Jesus said it's better to tie a millstone around your neck and cast it into the depth of the sea that mess with the least of God's children. In other words, instead of talking about people or complaining about your enemies, you need to tell your enemies what God you serve. This is what the children of Israel were doing when they were preparing for battle. They would start making a loud proclamation, and that proclamation would come in the form of a battle cry. And what you need to do, church, is understand that you need a battle cry before you go into battle. Many of us just find ourselves haphazardly stumbling into a battle. And the Bible is teaching us in verse 1 that God arising is not him emerging out of nowhere into somewhere, but he is being given as a notice to the enemy that God is getting ready to stand up in their situation. That the enemy needs to make a literal observation. It is also confirmation for the enemy that God, the Lord of hosts, the same God that parted the Red Sea and allowed his children to walk through on dry ground, the same God that led by a cloud by day and a fire by night, the same God that let David defeat the lion on the battlefield. Yes, let God, Jehovah, the Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Elohim, the same God that gave them a manna in the desert and also struck water from a rock, the God of miracles, the God of creation, the God who sits high upon the throne and is looking down at our situation. Yes, that God, he's the one that's on my side. I remember when I was a little boy and they would have kids come around the playground and they would talk trash. They said, I'm going to get my cousin from New York to come down and get you. We'd be like, so? Like, so it's just because somebody from New York, they were going to be big and bad and somehow just take over the playground. 
A lot of us try to claim that we are connected to certain people that we want to fight for us. But when we find out when the fight really comes, that we look around, they are nowhere to be found. Bible says, let God arise. His enemies scattered because once the enemy knew what God they were dealing with, that's when they didn't even want to bother with the fight. They would turn tails and head back up 95 in the other direction. You don't want to mess with a child of God because when you're messing with a child of God, you're messing with the daddy of the children. And when you're messing with me, you're messing with my daddy. And when my daddy is on my side, you better get out of my way. So in the situation, before I get into the problem, I got to have a heavenly vision. I got to see God's victory in every situation. It may look dark right now, but all I got to do is start practicing my battle cry. I got to go to my war room. I got to go to my prayer closet and understand that God is working out all things for my good. See God's victory in that situation. Secondly, we got to sing God's victory to the destination. Church name says, sing God's victory. Now, Bible man is a saint at church. Bible man likes to sing, but everybody at Bible man can't sing. Church name says, that's all right. You can spend all Saturday with Kelvin working on a solo, and it still ain't going to sound no better. But church name says, that's all right. Because the kind of singing that we like and the kind of singing that we think that we're talking about in verse 4 is not that kind of singing. We're not talking about the wicked wine. It's not of a clerkly kind of singing. We're talking about a song that's birthed out of an experience with God. And that singing comes from the word actually meaning a song leader. And so the reality is, if you study gospel music right now, most of the people behind the artists, Kelvin, they can't sing either. They just got somebody that's really good starting out the song and they're backing them up in the back. That's why they call background singers. <laughs> Just they say, neighbor, are you in the background? <laughs> Singing to God it started with somebody that started the song first, which was usually the best singer in the tribe, the best singer in the nation. And then the nation would join after the song leader and sing praises to his name. And that's what happens when you get a choir together. You learn how to put the people, Kelvin, where they are placed with people that can help them out a little bit, where they get off key or they get off notes. And then when we start singing together, it all begins to sound harmonious because the stronger voices are carrying the weaker voices because it's no longer about a solo. It's now a concert. And what God is doing is, is he's preparing the weak and the strong together to get ready for a literal fight. See, once they heard the battle cry, the chicken enemies would run as soon as they heard the cry. But just name said, that don't scare everybody. So what they had to do is, is get the song leaders together and start singing the song on their way down to the battlefield. See, it seems crazy to us now because many times in warfare, particularly in African nations, it was more about posturing than it was about actually hand-to-hand -hand combat. Many times one army was set up on one side of the valley and the other army was set up on the other side and they would throw out insults to one another. They would, they would launch missile weapons to one another, but it never really made impact. And it was clear to both generals of both armies that in order to have a real battle, they would specifically have to engage one another not on the other side of the hills but down in the valley and that's where the real fight starts brothers and sisters it's not why you're on the mountain top of life there will be some valley times where the songs of God will keep you while you are in the fight this is why our ancestors had songs that I'm so glad that trouble don't last always oh I'm so glad that trouble don't last always oh I'm so glad that trouble don't last always it won't last it won't last always 
See, they didn't have these songs of singing them on a mountaintop. They, they didn't have these songs sitting on a recliner with people fanning them with leaves. They was out on the cotton field with whips cracking on their backs and the sun beaming down on their heads and mosquitoes biting on every side of their legs and their arms. And they had to have a song that could keep them going while they were on the battlefield. Just they said, David, you better get you a song. Even if you can't sing, turn off all that trash you're listening to on the radio. Listen to some heavenly gospel music and get a song in your heart because when the enemy starts hearing you sing, they're going to wonder where is all this joy coming from? People gonna think you crazy looking at your situation. You broke, you ain't got no money, you ain't got no friends, you ain't got no loved ones, and they look at it and say they think you should have lost your mind. But when you start singing a song, not to yourself, but singing a song to God, that's when the victory is gonna lead you on to your destination. That word sing comes to the word sheer, which means to sing is particularly talking to the song leader. And what God is looking for in this dark valley time of the battle we're in, he's looking for some song leaders. He's looking for the Martin Luther Kings. He's looking for the Fannie Lou Hamers. He's looking for the W.E.B. Du Boises. He's looking for the Thurgood Marshals. He's looking for some song leaders who not only have had an experience with God, but are literally living to lead people through the valley time of the battle. Because in order to reach our destination, we need a song leader. But thirdly and lastly, after we sing God's victory to the destination, we got to share the victory with no hesitation. Touch name say share the victory. See, all the way down to verse 35 is where we can really start celebrating it. It tells us very clearly that God, you are all inspiring in your sanctuaries. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. I like that verse right there because it lets me know that God is not a selfish God in the sense of sharing his blessings. He doesn't give his blessings just to somebody or just one person. God has an overflow of blessings and that means when he's pouring it down on me, the overflow is on the, all of those who are close to me. And that's why I want to try to stay close to people who are connected to the heavenly vision and the heavenly values of God because the overflow does not come externally, it comes internally from what is already on the inside. And this is what God is saying to the children of Israel. He's not talking about power in terms of just political power. That word power comes from the word tatsuma, which means abundant might or collective power and this is how our nations really were built they were not built on the backs of one great leader or two great leaders they were built on the backs of a collective set of values that the people had as a result of a relationship with God in the sense that they were willing to share everything that God had given to them with everyone else there was used to be a time when we needed flour we could go right next door if we needed sugar we could go right next down the street. But now we don't want nobody to know that we ain't got no flour, that we ain't got no sugar, because we're so worried about somebody getting on the phone and talking about us. But what God is telling us, if you really want to be blessed, you got to learn to shake. Just let me say learn to shake. Amen. There used to be a time, Daddy told me all the time, about when folks would go to bed at night, they didn't even lock their doors. But now we can't even go to church without locking our doors in the parking lot. We can't even go home from church without looking over our shoulder and see who's following behind us. And the Israelites knew that they had to, to have sometimes God fight the battle for them. They knew other times that they had to actually fight in the battle. But then, once they would win the battle, the only way they were able to keep what God had given them in the battle was to share the spoils of the victory. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't go to heaven by yourself. 
This is where we are to truly be the church. The true church is a church that not only receives the gospel, but also shares the gospel. In other words, this is where transformation really takes place. It's when God begins to work in you in such a way you want to see him work in somebody else. That sharing that I'm talking about is a spirit of abundance. It's a spirit of collective power. When you understand until all of us are successful, none of us are successful. Until all of us are healthy, none of us are healthy. Until all of us have achieved wealth, none of us have achieved wealth. And what that looks like is, is that we never stop persisting until we reach a level of excellence, until all of us have gotten over. The people praise God for his protection of Israel and for the victories that they had received. Israel's triumph over his enemies typified God's final triumph in Christ over all other powers. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, I've already overcome the world. And Paul cited in the book of Ephesians that if we emphasize that through him all things are possible with God, in other words, he can do it according to the power that worketh in us. And now unto him who is able to give you exceeding abundantly above all you ask a thing according to the power that works in us. God has given us the victory not just because he, we are good, but because he is good. And as I close this message, I want to say to everyone on this fourth Sunday in May that God is an awe-inspiring God. He's not just God that sits in the heavens looking down at our situations. He feels the pain that we're feeling. He understands what we're going through because he's a very present help in the time of trouble. He's dispatching angels right now to our situation. He's not just the God of Israel. He is the God of the whole universe. And he gives power and strength to his people. He does not want to see you weak in your situation. He does not want to see the enemy have the upper hand. He wants you to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. And I gotta close and tell you a story. There's a story about a a young army soldier who was one day deeply in love with his young girlfriend. Yes, this young soldier was in love with a beautiful young woman. And before he was to be sent overseas for his next mission, he told her how much he loved her. He told her how much he wanted to spend the rest of his life with her. And before he got on the plane, he kissed her good he said he would write her every day to remind her of how much she meant to him. He told her as he went off to his next mission, he waved to her goodbye as a plane took off. And just as he promised while he was on his mission, he wrote her love letters every day saying, darling, you don't know how much you mean to me. You don't know how much I miss you. All I do every day and night is I think about you. A year and a half later, after he wrote her letters every day, he came back home to, from the mission. He kept running to the doorstep because he couldn't wait to see her. And when he got to the house, he knocked on the door and he was sad to see that she was standing there with another man. She had a ring on her finger. She was already married. And he said, baby, didn't I get your letters that I wrote you every day? She said, yes, I got them. And he said, well, who is this? And she said, that's what I'm trying to tell you. I married the mailman. Is there anybody here that think that faith is just writing love letters to God? Is there anybody here that they think that faith is just waiting for something to happen? without commit to anything. God wants us to be more than soldiers writing love letters. God wants us to be more than male men or girlfriends. God wants us to put our money where our mouth is and get the ring. Get on our knees and say, will you marry me? 
put your hands in my hands. And when you are ready to do what God is calling you to do, you will say, I will. I will. Yes, I will. Is there anybody there that's married to God? You say, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, in season and out of season, the death do us part. For God I live, and for God I die. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Is there anybody here that's got a right now praise? If you know him, let me hear you say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. God arrives. 